This video is going to be a film study look at the play of Giovanni Manu, the left tackle that the Lions drafted in the fourth round. Surprise, fourth round draft pick, 6'7", 350. You guys as Lions fans, you know, know all the intangibles or all the physical traits. Detailed to us as a raw prospect coming out of Canada, uh, played at a, a good college for, for Canadian football, if you ask me. I would be interested in, in seeing some of that level of football. I did end up getting Giovanni Manu film late um, in the summer unable to to really diagnose it and produce any for anything for Twitter. I don't put college film on my uh, YouTube channel. But one thing to note about him throughout the preseason is I feel like he did, he's very serious about his craft. You can see it. Offensive linemen have to be, clearly, to handle the level of athlete that they're going against, even at 6'7", 350. Um, I feel like his main weakness on moves that I have seen so far has been when he allows players to get to his chest. He allows someone to long arm or frame or stab him, you know, in the, usually in the middle of his of his right peck, and start to drive him back, start to walk him back to the quarterback, or at least move the pocket back further than you want it to be. Because of course he's six foot seven. Like I said, if he gets moved back in your field of view as a quarterback, you're going to have to throw the football around him. One thing to note as far as Manu before we get to the film, which I'll start with week one against the Giants, is he was drafted later in the CFL draft than he was in the NFL draft from a round standpoint, not from a pick standpoint. He was pick 126 in the fourth round of the NFL draft, pick 48, I believe, or 46 in the CFL draft, but that goes down as round five just because of the sheer number of teams in the NFL compared to the Canadian Football League. Let's get to some of the film, and we're going to start this with some film against the Giants. And I think Giovanni Manu is... First of all, I, I like the prospect that's there, number one. Number two, he's oftentimes very quick out of his pass set, quicker than the right tackle on the opposite side. Uh, and there's three different right tackles in the film that I'll show you, I think, across the, the better part of three games. This is the move that I would say at this point in time, uh, particularly week one, it works twice in week one uh, for 48, Whitley or Whiteley, that I think he had the most trouble with. It was almost like he was surprised that someone would land that strike on him. He wasn't able to get to swat the arm down with his inside hand, nor was he able to get his hands out on 48 sooner or earlier. Now, this happens to be a case where I think Hendon Hooker is getting to his third read. I talked about this in another video. I think he's on one, potentially, or maybe it's just a look off. But in any case, his face mask is clearly looking at a receiver running out into the flats. Two. Coming back here in this window, presumably a receiver on an in cut, and then tries to come back to three. So at that point, you know, how much time has Manu um, held in the pass, pass pro? I'm not sure. My point is that's the move that I feel like he has had the issue an, an issue with the most. And other, you know, Lions content creators may have a different opinion. You know, I certainly am not an offensive line guru, but I am willing to sit and watch the film. And in this case, I think I've got about 30 different pass sets where he doesn't seem to have difficulty with um, most other moves except for that long arm frame with the inside arm of a defensive end. Doesn't happen here. 48 tries a spin move. And once Manu has his hands on you, he generally, the rep is generally over. One thing I will say is he, he does seem to stop playing football at a certain point. Now, I don't mean he gives up on the play. That's not what I'm saying. But there does seem to be a certain point in time on some of these plays, I think at least two that you'll see in this cut-up, where I think he should stay on his guy longer. Just play till the whistle. That's very, that sounds very simple, but there's times where the, the scheme is over, what the design of the play is over, and Manu doesn't seem to adjust and adapt as well as other guys. Perhaps that's the Canadian football thing, lack of experience, I'm not sure. 48 actually trips over another Lions um, offensive lineman here. You know, maybe technically does he get a, a pancake? I'm not sure. But but he's still winning the route here either way from, from a pass pro standpoint with 48. He's got his hands out, and he's going to be able to take 48 away. This ends up being incomplete. I do think that there was a hold on the uh, DB dealing with Alexander there. Last one. This is early in that game against the – or early in the third quarter, I should say – against the Giants. The weather had cleared up. This is a, a better example of what I'm talking about. That long arm, that frame uh, stabbing up underneath from a low pad level. And you can see the the very slow or no reaction here by Manu. Maybe this was actually 
from a chronological standpoint, this one that I'm showing you now actually happened before the the other one that I showed you where 48 was able to get into get up into his chest. Maybe it's the first time he'd seen that in a game. It was week one of the preseason, right? It makes sense. So the level of athlete he's dealing with, I still really like what he does on a play-by-play -play basis. Certainly in week one, um, I would say that there were concerns out there as well there should have been. So four plays against the run before we get to the week three pass pro stuff, which I think shows uh, some some drastic improvements and a lot more ability to adjust to different to a wider variety of pass rushes. I didn't say it earlier, but you guys are obviously well aware as Lions fans. I mean, why would fans of another team be watching this? Uh, Giovanni Manu is a backup tackle. So I think there's also times where he loses his guy because the the second or third engagement, even though he's got a significant size and strength and, and edge and length of arms, again, people are able to get their hands on the inside of him and control him and then disengage at times in order to get involved in the play. Now, this is the, the go-ahead, I guess, game-winning or go-ahead touchdown run by Jefferson against the Steelers this past week. This is one of about four plays where I saw Manu kind of lose on the inside. Now, maybe sometimes you wrap your inside hand because that's where the play's going. So I understand that. And then the player is able to redirect that he's dealing with. This is a slightly different example form of describing. I think conceptually it still fits in that you've got a boot by Hooker opposite the run flow. And Manu is trying to take 96, get him going this way. And he'll lose him and then just keep working to the next guy. Fine, but the to me, the lack of athleticism at times for the players that he's dealing with, it does kind of show up, whether you're talking about week one, week two, or week three. Then finally, this just willingness to stay on people in the run game. I showed this play in another video, tackled by Nick Herbig on a run concept by Jefferson, kind of cuts it back. Manu is cupping on the backside, so you've got a Back block by the center, and Manu, as well as the tight end Mitchell, are kind of cupping on the backside, trying to create this wall on the backside so there's no penetration by the defense from, from, from the left side of the screen to get to the run play. Now, it ends up cutting back over there, but Manu, in my opinion, I'm not saying he's done playing football at this point, but there doesn't seem to be this overwhelming competitiveness to just drive this guy out of here. His job is relatively simple on the backside. I understand it. I feel like there could be a little bit more nastiness, a little bit more finish here. No, that's not a technical analysis. So, you know, forgive me for that. But, uh, you know, I am being picky here somewhat intentionally. These are the types of things. Manu is not on the field here, by the way. These are the types of things that I do wonder, are you going to be able to run with him on the field? I would like to have seen them done do this in the preseason to, to see him get out in space, see how he looks. This is a pin-pull toss that goes for nine yards. So both receivers over here, I think Davis and Kennedy are pinning down, and then the left tackle is pulling out wide to the left-hand side of the field, left-hand side of our screen. Toss play to Vaki, nine yards, get the tackle out there on someone in space, a, a corner, a nickel, and let him physically overwhelm that player, especially now with how they've changed the rules. I guess the DBs can't go low. It's a ridiculous rule change. But nonetheless, I would have liked to have seen them try that with Vaki to see how he performed, to see how he adapted in that situation. So this is moving forward to only focusing on film against the Steelers. Of course, the Steelers put a ton of pressure on Hendon Hooker in the first three or four possessions. None of that really was a res the responsibility of Giovanni Manu. I do feel like he... Um, he started to vary some of his sets. You know, it's the scheme, obviously, that Ben Johnson's calling for at times. But he's jumping guys more often in this week, which shows some confidence. I do think his angle on one of them is a, a little less than ideal. Very physical and very strong in this game. His hand strength must be unbelievable because once he gets a hold of these guys in the Steelers game, it's pretty much over. This is, I believe it's DeMarvin Leal, um, 98. Good player for the Steelers. He's been around for a while, played very well against the Ravens in 2022 in a somewhat unique defensive alignment that they used. He still gives up his chest at times, meaning it's there potentially for someone to try to long arm him, but maybe the Lions have tried to work on his set and change some of the, the foundational things that he does in terms of his pass set such that he's waiting for that move.
I don't know. That's just speculation. This is going to be another sack, but again, it's not attributed to Giovanni Manu. Gets his arms out on Liao, and it's it's a win. He ends up falling down on the ground. I think it's Herbig forces the uh, forces the fumble slap against the right tackle. You know, running by, really cool t- cool move, speed rush, slapping down with the inside arm, and then also using the outside arm to secondary slap on the right elbow, right tricep to clear and just run past. I feel like my news base may be a little more solid in week three against the Steelers. I could be wrong. I do have him when he's jumping guys, and I'll show you an explanation for that in a moment. When he's jumping someone, I do have him kind of almost heel tapping a little bit. Another sack, this one from under center on a third possession. He's jumping the uh, defensive end, trying to stay on him. It's chaos in the pocket there. But when he jumps here, you certainly don't want to jump. You know, you don't want to bucket step and jump too far and, and pretty much open the gate for an inside move, number one or number two, not have a solid base once you're getting to your third, fourth, and fifth step. But I feel like he's almost heel tapping here. I'll rewind it a couple of times so you can see it. You got to get out there. Don't get me wrong. When you're jumping someone, the idea is rather than a traditional pass set and then beginning to work your pass pro progression while the the edge rusher works his rush move, you're jumping him. You're jumping out almost in a direct line, but I feel like his feel like he's a little bit lateral on this one just slightly, maybe 6, 8, 10 degrees. It's not his fault that there's a sack at all. I'm glad to see him varying his um, his set. He's definitely wrapping, and then there is a hold. Don't get me wrong, but how often is it going to be called in the NFL, particularly when once you're so, you're so big, you're so strong, once you've got to hold a guy, pretty much the play is over. This will be a completion to Williams over the middle. I love this set by him. Very patient and reactive. So I don't know that 53 has used this move a lot. So 53 is going to rush on the outside. And I'll try to rewind it multiple times so you guys can see it. What Manu does with his hands to basically let 53 swat down on air. And the move, well, the move is over no matter who the rusher is. You can see he's missed. Manu has removed his hands and then now got inside hand position. No matter who he's going up against, the move is over at that point. I thought it was a a nice little adjustment during the play, Uh, during the move by 53. You can tell he's well-trained. Obviously, the Lions offensive line coach is really high level. O-line, in that case, gives Hooker a clear throwing lane to hit Isaiah Williams for 17 yards. Hooker ends up scrambling here. Let's boat out a little bit more here than maybe earlier um, Earlier in the preseason. Ends up riding 53 out of here. 53 is going for the speed rush. Trying to dip underneath. Manu identifies it. I think he identifies it here. So he's just going to stay on him. Maybe that right hand is a little too late. 53 is able to get there. If Hooker set pass drop was a little bit deeper, maybe it would have been a problem. I wonder what kind of work he's getting um, in practice with against against the edge defenders, meaning how often is he seeing speed rushes? I would think that that's the move that guys are going to go to first to see if he can handle it. Jumps 38 again, gets a hold of him. I'll let you see it three or four times. The steps, these seem to be way more disciplined than the other jumping that I'm talking about. Shorter, choppier steps, allowing him to stay balanced. Now, he also has the threat of 33 and 29 walked up here, so that could have something to do with it in terms of him expecting maybe 38 to threaten the rush and drop out, so he wants to stay in a more balanced, almost flatter stance than the other jump rep that I showed you so that if both of those guys rush, which they do, he could redirect and help out. Again, I'm describing if 38 drops out to the flats and both of those guys rush, Perhaps that's why he's using a slightly different technique. We're not going to talk about 63, absolutely whiffing. Looks like his feet get caught up. I thought Manu looked a little more technical. I thought he looked more confident with his hands uh, by the time week three came around. So progress. Again, I'm not an O-line guru. I would, If I were you, I would defer to other Lions content creators that break down offensive line film consistently. If there is no one who does that, um, I can find somebody. I know somebody who wants to, and I know somebody who's 
certainly qualified to do so. So let me know in the comment section who you go to for offensive line grading or evaluation. I don't necessarily have the time to do it. In this case, because of Giovanni Manu, the unique situation, the way that he was drafted from Canada with the Lions trading up, I think, twice in the fourth round, in fact, selecting him and then Sione Vaki. I thought it was worthy of attention. Does he, you know, does he look like a starting caliber left tackle right now? No. Does he look like a guy that could have gone against Highsmith 25, 28 times in organic pass sets and not had difficulty? You know, no, he does not. Alex Highsmith, if you don't know, plays on the right-hand side of the Steelers' defense. T.J. Watt almost exclusively plays on the left. So Giovanni Manu would have been matched up against Highsmith. Other teams, you know, kind of mix and match their rushers. Highsmith has a, a long history of winning with multiple moves, being a very active football player. Uh, I have, as a Ravens fan, admired his game. I find him to be extremely underrated. So could Manu have gone out there and, and been able to handle him the way he handled some of these other guys? No, I don't think so. He's not to that level yet. But A, I trust the Lions offensive line coach. B, I think the Lions staff and front office knew what they were doing by drafting him. Nonetheless, I'm okay if people want to say, hey, I thought we should have drafted a receiver somewhere in there, or I thought, you know, whatever. I do like Isaiah Williams. I think he's going to make the team. We'll find out here in a little while at, at 4 p.m. I released this video about an hour early, so you guys could check it out. I hope to have another Lions video out late Tuesday night if you guys are interested that will focus on the matchup against the Rams and a couple of things that the Lions were able to do offensively to exploit LA's defense. I almost said St. Louis. That's how old I am. In any case, you guys let me know what you think of the film study video that I tried to portray here about Giovanni Manu, some of the small improvements that I think have been made. And I still wonder or have a question about any bull rush moves that are located with the inside arm, long arm frame is what I call it, where that hand makes contact first. I, deal, I do still wonder about his effectiveness or ability to deal with that and what his counter will be, basically him being able to sit down and anchor such that he's not walked back into the quarterback's face. I appreciate you guys' time, man. If you enjoyed the video, please let me know in the comment section. And if you think other Lions fans would enjoy this film study video, admittedly flawed on my part, uh, nonetheless, a uh, film study video of Giovanni Manu, then please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media to help this content get more reach.